I'm just wondering, do we have a moderator? Ah, good. So, um, hello, guys. Let's present uh, the... Um, okay. So... So thank you very much, and uh, my thanks to the organisers for giving us a chance to report on this project. So this is a machine, a package, an open source package for doing machine learning in Julia. Uh, it's been funded by the Alan Turing Institute uh, in cooperation with um, an institute in New Zealand called NESI and Julia Computing. Uh, our, the Alan Turing Institute seems quite happy with this project. It's now their uh, top, most starred repo, and, which I guess is good for Julia. And um, they've just renewed our, our funding, which is kind of nice. So machine learning comes in uh, kind of two main flavors. The first is called um, supervised learning. And in supervised learning, uh, Basically, you're trying to predict some target variable, we'll call it Y, from a knowledge of some other variables which collectively we refer to as X. So um, for a simple example, you might uh, suppose we're trying to predict the temperature in this room, um, and we suppose that we've measured the temperature at hourly intervals, and we'd like to predict the temperature at some other time. So in this case, our, our target variable would be uh, the temperature, and the, the input features, or uh, would be just a single variable the time of day. So how does one go about um, actually doing this kind of a prediction? Well, you could do something like try and fit some polynomials to the data, maybe a, a straight line and then some more sophisticated attempts. Uh, but then to uh, actually evaluate your model, you need some more data, right? So let's suppose I've actually held back from you and tell you that I've actually measured the temperature um, at every half hour interval so let's put in the extra data, take away the training data, and now we get a more reasonable way of estimating the performance of our model by sort of measuring the deviation between this uh, training data, sorry, this, this evaluation data that we held back and the different uh, uh, polynomials that we're trying. So I think in this case the green curve looks the best. So what we have here is a, a hyperparameter. So the degree of this polynomial is a, what we call a hyperparameter. And any kind of supervised machine learning, you'll have one, typically one or more hyperparameters. And a sort of central um, task for the data scientist is to tune those hyperparameters to maximize his performance. Another um, flavor of machine learning, which is called supervised learning, and for the purpose of this talk, we'll just understand that as learning some kind of data transformation. Uh, the only example I'm really going to talk about is uh, dimension reduction. Uh, so this might work something like this. You've got, say, two variables, data in two variables. You plot the data, and you want to reduce the number of variables to, say, just one variable. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, you may be doing supervised learning, the kind of um, predictive modeling that I just talked about, but maybe your algorithm isn't handling the many, many features that you have in a more complicated problem, and you need to cut them down. So suppose we have this example of two variables. And you might notice that the data uh, here is sort of varying more in one direction than the other. So you kind of you know, adapt your coordinates to that observation and throw away the variable uh, x2 where the data is not varying very much. And you essentially just project everything in one direction. So that's an example of dimension reduction. Now, it would be awfully nice um, if all the machine learning models that there are, I mean, I should say perhaps that I mean, while these, these examples I mentioned are simple, Sort of morally speaking, you can kind of think of at least supervised learning as some kind of curve fitting. So there are lots of different uh, machine learning models, and it would be awfully nice if they all lay in one single Julia package, but they're scattered in multiple packages, and in other languages, you know, there are hundreds of packages doing uh, different kinds of machine learning tasks. So this is why we need a, a toolbox. Uh, a toolbox, a machine learning toolbox, provides a uniform interface for training your models, for evaluating their performance, for tuning those hyperparameters, and for benchmarking. 
Uh, it usually provides some kind of common processing task like data cleaning and allows um, more and more, especially nowadays, for some kind of model composition, that is for combining different models together or for, um, for chaining uh, different uh, procedures together, machine learning uh, modeling together. So uh, here are some of the more um, a dominant open source toolboxes in other spaces. So in, in uh, Python, you have scikit-learn. Uh, in uh, Java, you have Weka, and in R, you have these two packages, MLR and R. Um, so what are going to be the goals for our Julia package? So I, I feel I've been in a sort of a, a lucky position here where we have this Julia, new Julia language, and there isn't kind of a, um, a mature toolbox yet. So how are we going to do things maybe a little better than how they're done elsewhere? Or what are our goals going to be over, uh, for this new uh, toolbox? Well, there are the usual candid candidates for things that we'd like to have. Um, and we, in particular, wanted to make our package very usable. So that's kind of maybe the, of this list the most important. Um, as far as performance goes, that we we're happy to sort of uh, have more usability at the cost of, of, of performance, which isn't really such uh, an, an, which we can have the luxury of really doing that because generally in machine learning, the performance bottlenecks are kind of in training the, the core algorithms that you're wrapping rather than this sort of this extra layer of, um, that comes on top with the toolbox. And then when we were thinking about this, we obviously wanted to avoid the pain points we'd experienced um, in other toolboxes. And the rest of the talk is kind of going to have a look at how we try to smooth over those very, uh, some of those, some of those uh, pain points that we had observed. So the first um, thing that can be a little challenging, at first, especially for someone who's new to machine learning, is how do you actually decide or how do you identify which models are actually going to be work for the particular task that you have in mind? And even if you're more experienced, it can be, you know, it's nice to be able to systematize that process somehow. The second thing um, is that even in some, uh, some of the existing packages, if, toolboxes, routine operations sometimes seem to require a bit more code than you'd like. You'd like things to be a little bit more automated uh, than they are. So I'll start by discussing uh, just these two uh, pain points and return to more as we go through the talk. So uh, how do we address this model search, this model identification uh, issue? So in MLJ, we have uh, a model registry. So just like you can register your uh, Julia package with Julia, you can register your package with us, and then any model in your package which implements our interface becomes essentially searchable from, from, for the, any MLJ user. And the, the, some metadata associated with those models is also accessible. So if you're running MLJ, one of the first things you could do is just get a list of all the models that are currently implementing the interface by running this command models. Then once you have a particular uh, data set and in mind and uh, you know what you want to do with the data, you can currently formulate what we call a task. Uh, here's just a, a built-in task called the Boston data task. And then you can specify your, you know, restrict your search to just that task and then get a list of models that will actually uh, be, a, you'll be able to use on your model. Uh, what's some of the what are some of the ways in which uh, we try and make um, writing the, the, the code efficient so you're not writing too much code? What are some of the tasks that you might do often that you want to do efficiently? Well, um, one example is just simple model evaluation. So uh, let's, let me go into a little bit of detail here. So the first step, if you wanted to evaluate a model, would be to load in the code because um, the, the model search just tells you what, where, what models are around. It doesn't actually bring the model uh, code into scope. So you load the model code. Then this next line here instantiates the model, in this case some kind of decision tree. Then there's a step that uh, wraps the model and the, with the data, the task. And then in just one line you can evaluate the model. So uh, according to some resampling strategy such as the holdout strategy I mentioned in that first example, and you can specify any number of uh, metrics for uh, measuring your performance. So that's one kind of task. Uh, another thing we do to um, 
make the amount of code you write sort of efficient and also to conceptually simplify things is that simple meta-algorithms are uh, implemented as model wrappers. So probably this kind of thing is already familiar. You may be wanting to construct an ensemble of models, say 100 trees, to, to com uh, decision trees to create some kind of uh, random forest. So you simply create you simply wrap the, the, the atomic model in this ensemble model and have a new model called Forest, and, and that's a model like any other that you can fit. Um, what may be less familiar is the idea of uh, implementing tuning as a wrap model wrapper. So let's suppose we have this random forest model and we want to tune it. So what, how would you do that in MLJ? Well, you might start by specifying a couple of hyperparameters that you want to tune. And in this case, because our model is actually a model within models, it's, you have nested hyperparameters, which you handle in a sort of more or less obvious way. Then uh, you wrap the forest in what we call a tuned model, uh, which is basically wrapping your model in a tuning strategy. So in this case, it's a grid search, and we're going to evaluate performance, estimate performance with a more complicated resounding strategy called cross-validation. And then you specify your metric measure in your, your ranges. So what this does is it creates a new model, just like any other model, which you can think of as a self-tuning model. So now when I fit that model, that means find the best values for those hyperparameters and then retrain on all available data. Or if you like, I'm kind of moving the hyperparameters together with the other fitted parameters. So now it's a model like any other. I can attach it to data, which is what's happening in this first step, and call the evaluate function. And in this case, because, uh, because there's quite a lot happening in this little bit of code, because fitting the tuned model means doing cross-validation to estimate the hyperparameter to, to optimize the model, uh, and then I'm evaluating that model using some resampling strategy. I've got resampling within resampling, so I've got nested resampling. So that's kind of neat, I suppose. So that's a, a little bit of code um, showing how we kind of address these, task, uh, these pain points here. Another common pain point, I suppose, is, is passing from the source of your data to the actual algorithmic, the algorithm-specific data format, the, the, the form of the data that your machine learning algorithm actually uh, needs. And in MLJ, we try to make that, that um, passage as direct as possible. So basically, in MLJ, what you can do is connect any um, of the popular sources in Julia, such as data frames or maybe one of the uh, SQL um, databases or JuliaDB or maybe just a file directly to the algorithm, to the model. And it's sort of the role of the model implementation to sort out um, putting that into the format that the model needs. Now, that said, there's still going to be some uh, sort of type coercions because we, we, we need to have observe some conventions about how we'll interpret the various kinds of data. So uh, to make that somewhat um, easier and for other reasons, uh, and because it's Julia and we have this ni nice type system, we decided to formalize a notion of scientific types. So as distinguished with machine types like integer or float, uh, we have these things which, just, which are Julia types, which we call scientific types. They don't have any instances. They're just basically used for dispatch. And, and the, so things like, for example, continuous or count data or maybe ordered factor. So um, if you don't want to think too hard and you have some data frame, for example, um, you can first inspect the data and see, well, does it conform to the, to the, um, to the scientific type interpretation that Julie is going to do by default? And if it doesn't, you just say, OK, please convert this column to count data and it'll worry about finding the right type for you if you want to not think about it too much. Right, so one thing we don't do is we don't, um, we don't uh, use integers to uh, represent categorical data. Um, there's good reasons for doing that. This is kind of a classic uh, trap for beginners. So that's, but it's still common in other platforms. So in scikit-learn, typically the way you deal with categorical data is you're, you're required to relabel it as integers. But if you do that, you run into this trap, which is if you split the data, it can happen that um, in the training, uh, process, you don't see all of the levels of your data, of your categorical variable. So here the evaluation has got a three, but there's no three here. So when you go to evaluate, the code crashes and it's, it's a thorny problem. So there are various ways to work arounds for this, but the simplest from a design point of view is really to just 
insist upon a dedicated uh, categorical data type, which is what we do. So that means that each value then is not just a value, but has a pointer to the pool of all possible values. That requires a little bit more memory, but unless you do this in a completely stupid way, it's not an order of magnitude extra cost. Yes? So if you have a categorical variable, instead of representing it as... Is the, so the question is, how do I represent categorical variables? That's correct, yes. Oh, what we, you wouldn't represent it as integers at all. So you'd represent it with this, this uh, data type, which we've decided to use categorical array, uh, categorical value from ca the categorical arrays package. So each value then is a, is a more complicated a type, which, isn't, which represents a particular value, but also points to all the possible values. And, and then you can actually look at, you can look at a human um, readable sort of representation of that at the same time. So there's, a, you know, uh, points to a string or whatever depending on the, uh, how it's represented originally in the data. Sure. Um, so what else? Uh, that's a little bit about uh, data. Uh, we've also found that um, uh, in terms of probabilistic predictors, some of the other toolboxes are not so immediately friendly. So by probabilistic prediction, I mean, say, I want to predict whether it's what the chance of rain is tomorrow. Is it going to be 20% or 80% rather than is it going to rain? So um, there are, so that is a little bit, not quite as convenient to do in some other platforms, but for reasons of time, I'm not going to discuss that more here. Um, the final thing I do want to talk about is the limitations of model composition in other interfaces. Um, and I think this is really the big one for us, and I think this is where MLJ is going to be quite strong. So the reason that I think this is the most important is this is really a barrier to innovation. So the various other things um, may be, you know, a pain, um, but this, I think, is kind of a really more serious limitation uh, or has become a serious limitation. So how, uh, that's what I want to talk about a bit more. How do we combine models together? So first, let me just explain this simple example of model composition that I'll return to in a moment. You, uh, uh, let's suppose we're um, classifying emails as either spam or not spam, Okay. And we've, we've chosen some sort of um, classifier to do that. But it may be that this classifier is struggling to deal with the many, many features you would have in this problem because basically each word in the language is going to correspond to a feature. So we need to do, first do some kind of dimension reduction. So our email uh, message uh, would come in as this big X and then somehow those, that, that would, after being transformed, have a new representation that was somehow a compressed representation, and that's what would be sent to the classification algorithm to, to, kindly, to finally decide whether, yes, this is spam or not spam. Uh, what about other kinds of model composition? That may be a bit more complicated. Um, well, I'll, let me talk about, for a minute, data science competitions. Uh, here's an example of three randomly picked data science composi uh, competitions from Kaggle. I just picked three at random. And these are the leaderboards, so um, these are the top performers in the competitions. And the point I want to make here is if you look here, these, these avatars, that most of the people doing well here are typically teams. Now, why would you form a team in a data science competition where you've got to split up the prize money, right? $20,000. Well, it doesn't sound that much when you've got to split it among five people, and it's a lot of work. Well, the reason there are, the teams do well in competitions is because they win. They, why do they, they tend to win competitions? They do tend to do well. And the reason is that typically what will happen is that different members will focus on a different model, a different class of models, and then the team will blend those different predictive models together to get a final uh, submission to the competition. So how do you blend uh, model predictions together? Well, here's one way you can do it. And uh, just to take a simplest case, suppose you're just blending two model predictions. You might have two models, say this one, model one and model two. Each of them makes a prediction. Let's call them Y1 and Y2. Then rather than doing the naive thing, which you can do and people do in Kaggle competitions, which is just to somehow average those predictions or get a majority vote, you can do something a bit more clever, which is to make those predictions the actual the features or the inputs of a new adjudicating model. Okay? So that's the basic idea of stacking. 
uh, when you when you then try to nail down how nail down how you should train this kind of arrangement, because really here I'm I'm just showing you how all this works in a kind of deployment uh, in production, then then things are a little bit more complicated, and I'm not going to attempt to explain the, the, how the training works. But the point to make is that um, this is not sort of trivial, but we would like to have an, a model composition API for uh, MLJ that can handle this kind of you know, complications. In fact, should be able to do basically whatever we will, you know, maximally flexible if possible. The final example of model composition I want to mention is uh, target transformation. So I've talked about feature, uh, the imp transforming the inputs, but when you transform targets, there's a little subtlety in that at the end of the game, when you've got your prediction, you've got to do an inverse transformation. Uh, and it turns out that that's, although that sounds innocuous enough, um, a request for that kind of feature in the model composition API for Psychic Learn is still open and has been open since 2015. <laughs> so, um, and in MLJ, it's it's more or less, I wouldn't say trivial, but it's no more complicated than what I'm going to describe in more detail now for this simpler example on model composition. So, uh, I want to show, actually show a little bit about what our API looks like in this case. So the, the goal is to combine, somehow combine those two models into just a single model, which we'll call composite. And the simplest way you might imagine, in, uh, uh, the simplest sort of feature you might uh, give the user is to just have some kind of a macro that combines the two models together. But the problem is that this doesn't really generalize to more complicated uh, topologies and so on. So how do we do it in MLJ? Well, let's first just look, take these two bits uh, individually in isolation to start with. So let's have a look at the dimension reduce. So how does just ordinary training and uh, transformation look like for, for this transformer, this dimension reducer? So this is the code that will do that. So the first line basically instantiates the model we want to use and say some PCA model. The next stage uh, binds the model with the data, the input data X. Then we fit the model and then finally we carry out the actual transformation, which in this case we're doing with the training data to get our output X more. Okay. The, the syntax for training a supervised model is basically identical. The only difference here is we have to worry about the target variable when we, when we bind the data to the model to the data, we have to include the target data as well. And now, of course, the input is this reduced, the, the, the output of the previous model, the, the re dimension reducer. So here's a summary of that code, which is really unstreamlined code in the sense that uh, it's not so convenient at the present, because if I ch make some changes, suppose I want to change the output dimension of the dimension reducer, I have to rerun all this code, right? So um, how do we now somehow collapse this into this, this one composite model in MLJ? Well, the basic idea was uh, that all this code here essentially encodes everything we want to do. So why don't we just use the code that's here to make our composite model? And so that's, in fact, what you do in MLJ. So as a pre-step, what you do is in instead of giving these, these, this code the, the data in a raw form, you put a light wrapper around uh, the data. So that's what this source X is. Source is for a source node in a, in a graph, if you like to think about it as a graph. And essentially what that does is it tells the rest of the methods that follow, you know, lazily, lo you know, lazily um, implement b these, these methods. Or thought of another way, it says, instead of thinking of these as just commands that we execute one after another, think of these, this code as uh, equations expressing relationships between the different variables. So how is the, imp how is the uh, x small related to the x? Well, it's the transformation, of the et cetera, et cetera. And simply coming all the way down to y hat. The next step is we can throw away these fit methods because we're going to fit this whole thing as one object what do you do? You call, the, you call fit on the last um, variable or node. And now we can uh, already get predictions if we like. So we would call, to get predictions now, say on training rows, we would call that final variable rather than indexing it. We'd call it in this way and get some predictions. And then if we had wanted to apply this, this, this composition to a new data, we call the final variable on the new data, which essentially makes a substitution of that rack data we had before. So instead of having the X there, you just substitute the X for the new data. 
So that's um, so what we've done so far is construct what I call a learning network. That's take, kind of taking these two bits and connecting them together like that. But we're not quite done. We, re we want this final standalone model, which initially shouldn't be attached to any data. So we can reuse it on some different data uh, and so on. And so it'll behave like any other model. And all the other meta-algorithms will apply to it, the tuning and so on. So that is achieved by one final step, which is just a macro call. But now this is a macro call which is being applied to a very general object, this, these, these learning networks. So that's, um, that's, I think, oh, one more step is just to say, make the point that this new uh, thing I've constructed isn't a model like any other. Actually, what this macro does is it constructs a new model type and then an, also an instance of that type at the same time uh, using defaults from the defaults in, that were given in the network. And then you just give, you can, you can fit it like any other model. So you can give it new data, say X2 and Y2, fit it, predict, whatever you want to do with it. So um, that's all I, uh, I think I'll say in about the, our goals for MLJ, except for this final goal, which has been our hope to try and add some focus to Julia machine learning development more generally, uh, trying to bring the different parts uh, together, like the tabular data formats and uh, um, loss functions and so on, and maybe also try and bridge some of the gaps between the different machine learning paradigms, like you have the deep learning and you have probabilistic programming and so on. Um, and uh, to finish, I'll talk a little bit about the roadmap for the future. So I should say that the, the package is a functioning package. It doesn't have every bell, all the bells and whistles, but you can start to use it, and we hope that you will use it and give us lots of feedback. Um, the way in which you can help us the most is it with this first slide here is, in, is enhancing our functionality by adding more models. So we have some sort of most of the kind of popular models are, are, are implemented, but we're always looking to implement more models. So, uh, so here are a few of the projects underway, or will, will uh, at the moment. One is that we'd like to wrap uh, as much of the psychic learn models as possible, because there's like a lot of models there, over 100 models. Um, that project kind of got a little bogged down, but now we've had a, a good boost um, in that direction with some help from Zach Nugent. Uh, we, I have a, um, we have a UCL uh, summer intern who's working on a flux integration that's a pretty, pretty far way along and you can already go, if you want, check out, um, it's MLJ Flux. Uh, there's a, a, a repo already with some, a public repo, you can look at the code, there's no documentation or anything yet and it's, nothing's fixed in terms of API, but that's well, well along. We would like feedback on, on what you think of that um, attempt. Um, we have been interacting with the people at Turing.jl, uh, no association with the Turing Institute, um, who have a, which is a nice and very popular package for doing probabilistic programming. So um, that's turning out to be challenging, but I think it will be very worthwhile to, to push along. And there's some interest from the Geostats people to do some integration there. But you know, the, those among you who are working on other packages in machine learning are very keen to hear from you. And, and, maybe, and we're very keen to give guidance in terms of implementing our interface, which is pretty well documented, but it's, it's not a sim it's the simplest of interfaces, so I, and we're, we're keen to help. And that's, uh, have I run out of time? One minute? All right. So I think I can make it in one minute. So the other, other things, of, uh, we can enhance the core functionality that we still haven't done systematic, systematic benchmarking, just haven't got around to it. We'd like to have more comprehensive performance evaluation, and add uh, more sophisticated kinds of tuning. So tuning at the moment is fairly limited. We've got grid search. I think we'll probably have some kind of random search very soon. But we'd like to have Bayesian optimization, which I think is a really nice uh, way to do optimization. And also tuning by gradient descent using AD. And my time is up. So I will just finish with um, saying that we also like to broaden the scope uh, in various ways. and scale things up and we have a nice dagger scheduling project happening and thank you for your attention anyone having any questions
So, um, you know, there was like an attempt before, like Scikit uh, learned or JL, and it's trying to do something similar, not, not quite to the extent that you're doing. Uh, but I mean, there's a lot of like uh, machine learning models that uh, in Julia that now integrate with Scikit-Learn or JL. Uh, so I mean, is that something? I mean, how do you see this evolving? Do you see complementarity, competition? Uh, can you like leverage some of the things that have already been integrated into Scikit-Learn? Well, um, I suppose we're we're going to be indebted to Scikit-Learn for a while. Scikit-Learn.jl for a while because we're we're while when I say we're wrapping the Scikit-Learn models, we're actually wrapping the Julia Rapp of the scikit-learn models that is achieved in scikit-learn.jl. Um, I, th I think, well, the, because scikit-learn is really, scikit-learn.jl is just a wrap of, of the Python package. It doesn't have, it, it, it's limited by, by, but it can never, it can never do the sorts of things that MLJ is going to do because it, you know, it's, scikit-learn itself is already, um, more than 10 years old, it's sort of, you know, it's kind of converging to sort of, I think, its limits in terms of what it can provide as a toolbox. So we are able, as I think I've hoped to describe here, to maybe push things a little uh, beyond those capabilities. And I, so as far as, in terms of models that are already implementing the scikit-learn.jl interface, um, they're some of the easier models for us to then kind of um, implement uh, on our eyes. We would hope that they would also implement ultimately our interface, I guess. So, so, so I mean like one, one way you can do is that you can, uh, scikit-learn or JL now calls a lot of uh, uh, very uh, mature Python-based uh, uh, machine learning. Uh, well, it's, it's all, call, all calling So Python, all, yeah. all callable now from, yeah. from yeah, MLJ. Yeah. Thank you. So compare, compared to the Python uh, scikit-learn, the real scikit-learn, yes. how do you see this is, um, um, more competitive and, and more functional than that, or are you still trying to catch up? What, what do you feel? Oh, well, so that's a good question. Um, in terms, the biggest limitation uh, in, in comparing our uh, interface with scikit-learn is that scikit-learn is, um, you know, there are hundreds of models that are implemented, has huge amounts of documentation, you know, and it's making use of mature libraries, you know. We can't pretend to compute, compete with scikit-learn today. Mm. I think we're looking more forward, and I think, uh, in particular in the area of uh, model composition. I think that what you can do with MLJ is far more powerful than what you could do with, 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 Py, with scikit-learn in any case. Um, fairly confident in saying that, yet to be seen. Um, so that, you know, I, th I think that's exciting. That you'll be able to, I think, more easily and more quickly combine models in more in creative ways, hopefully, yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. So let's have a round of applause for Anthony. Thank you. Um.